everybody. Um, very nice to see you again. Um, I'm Alexandre Michy. Uh, I'm the chair of the telecardiology working group of the ISFTH. Uh, and um, I have uh, today uh, exceptional um, uh, cardiologists presenting uh, uh, the webinar, uh, Hot Topics in Preventive Cardiology. Um, the webinar um, is hosted by myself and by Professor Sergio Manuel Kaiser and uh, has as invites um, Dr. Erin Mikos, uh, Dr. Atul Patak and Dr. Peter Lansberg. Uh, I would just start with a short uh, introduction um, of the telecardiology working group, um, which I will share my screen. Uh, and afterward, afterwards, I will leave the, um, uh, the word to uh, Professor uh, Sergio Kaiser. So, um, welcome to the this secretary um, of the ISFTH, uh, Mr. Frank Livens, has prepared a few slides for us. I will leave uh, the slides uh, speak. Yeah, if they work, no, no, it doesn't work. Sorry for that. <laughs> I try to share my screen <laughs> once again. So. Well, sometimes you have this kind of um, uh, unexpected uh, technological books. Exists to facilitate the international dissemination of knowledge and experience in telemedicine and e-health and to provide access to recognized experts in the field worldwide. It is a non-governmental and non-for-profit society, primarily an umbrella for national telemedicine and e-health organizations also including associate, institutional, corporate, individual, nurse, and students. It communicates through its uh, website, a quarterly newsletter, member announcements, and through the International Society for Thermos and E-Health e-journal. On the website, you also find a chapter with all sorts of information which we call knowledge resources. You find also the recorded uh, webinars from the recent past. You will find information about the current working groups and their activities mm -hmm. and uh, also under education and contributions you will find uh, chapters on history, good pro practice models and national e-health strategies. Enjoy this webinar. So this has been a, a small introduction by uh, the secretary of the ISFTH, Mr. Frank Levens. I would also like to salute um, my dear friend and the vice chair of the telecardiology working group, uh, which is Dr. Adolfo Sparenberg from Brazil, uh, uh, which is also uh, watching. And uh, without further delay, I would like to introduce uh, Professor Sergio Emanuel Kaiser, uh, which is a professor of internal medicine at Rio de Janeiro State University in Brazil. Thank you very much, Sergio, for participating. Thank you very much for your contribution, huge contribution to this webinar. Uh, and also thank you uh, also to all the, uh, all the speakers for accepting to uh, give talks uh, to this webinar. So Sergio, you have the word, please. Thank you, Alex. Uh, good afternoon uh, from Rio de Janeiro. The sunny city today is rather cold and uh, rainy. Uh, so it's a privilege for me to co-chair this webinar with you, Alex, and thank you very much for your invitation. And I also wish to thank our panelists who uh, so kindly accepted our invitation to take part in this activity. Uh, not only we have today among us three highly skilled experts in their areas, all under the umbrella of preventive cardiology. But I also wish to tell you how much I'm pleased to see the four of you, even though through a computer screen. In the beginning of 2020, I was looking forward to meet the four of you either at ACC or at the European Society of Cardiology meeting. But then came the pandemic and blew up everybody's desire to gather and you know, interact in person with each other. So 
at least we're mediating uh, this, uh, um, this, this situation through the, through the internet. And it's good that we have this technology now to spread information and education. So uh, without further delay, let's move on to the first presenter, uh, Dr. Erin Mikos. She's an associate professor of medicine within the Division of Cardiology at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine Center for the Prevention. Uh, uh, she's an associate director of preventive cardiology within the Chikaron uh, Center for the Prevention of Cardiovascular Disease at Johns Hopkins. And uh, her presentation will be entitled, Women Are Not Just Smaller Than Men, Sex-Specific Cardiovascular Disease Prevention for Women. So please, Erin, the whole world is listening to you. Great, hopefully you can see my slides. Thank you for having me here to be part of this webinar. So this is US data, but since the year 2000, fortunately cardiovascular disease death rates have been going down in women. Although in recent years, this progress, there's been plateauing and actually an uptick in mortality in both men and women. In fact, heart disease rates are actually um, rising the fastest among middle-aged women, um, hallmarking that we need more intensive preventive focus in this group. Now, both men and women need their traditional risk factors assessed, but I want to point out that there's actually disparities in the risk conferred by traditional risk factors in that smoking and diabetes are greater risk factors in women compared to men. Older women have a higher prevalence of hypertension and less adequate control. And at the time of the menopausal transition, women have an acute change in their lipids with the loss of estrogen with a rise in total and LDL cholesterol. Additionally to these traditional risk factors, there are risk factors unique to women that men do not experience. Um, my colleagues and I recently wrote this review article in the American Journal of Preventive Cardiology about sex-specific risk factors in women across their lifespan, and I'm going to touch on a few of these today. First, I'll start with party in younger women. So um, there's some studies, although not all, that show that women who have multi-party, more than five live births, have increased cardiovascular risk later in life. And this is one of our studies from the multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis that we published last year, where we found that women with a history of five or more live births were less likely to be in optimal cardiovascular health when they got to middle or older age group. So again, a group that might need more preventative focus. But more concerning is women with a history of adverse pregnancy outcomes. So it's very important that we take a reproductive history in our women, that patients, that women with a history of gestational diabetes, gestational hypertension, preeclampsia, small for gestational age, preterm delivery. These women are at increased risk of cardiovascular disease decade after their index pregnancy. And that's why that women, even if they're outside of childbearing years, we need to ask women about their pregnancy history because these could be red flags that identify women who need a more preventative focus. For example, this is data uh, that was published by Dr. Pensy Wu, um, looking at over 6 million women. And uh, they found that preeclampsia history was associated with a fourfold increased risk of heart failure and a twofold increased risk of subsequent cardiovascular disease. And similarly, preterm delivery, especially before 32 weeks, is associated with a twofold increased risk of future cardiovascular disease. Now, why is this such a risk factor? Well, we're not sure what's the chicken versus the egg. It may be that women who develop adverse pregnancy outcomes, that maybe they had pre-existing endothelial dysfunction or cardiometabolic risk factors that was subclinical, and then during pregnancy, it was a stress test that they ultimately failed, and these became manifest. Alternatively, it seems likely, though, that the antithrombotic and inflammatory risk of a preeclampsic pregnancy may directly cause uh, endothelial damage and dysfunction that leads to subsequent cardiovascular risk. Additionally, in young women, we should consider polycystic ovarian syndrome. This is a heterogeneous syndrome, and not all PCS women are at risk, but it seems that the ones that have hyperandrogenism are. It's associated with insulin resistance, weight gain, dyslipidemia, and future cardiovascular risk. And while there's some uh, dis disagreement whether 
the future cardiovascular risk is entirely explained by the risk factors or not. Um, regardless, these are women at higher risk that warrant a more intensive focus, particularly intensive lifestyle changes and control of body mass index in their younger years to help mitigate um, cardiovascular risk later in life. Another really important risk factor is premature menopause. Uh, the average age of menopause in Western countries is around 52 years, and there seems to be a linear uh, inverse risk with uh, premature menopause and cardiovascular disease, such that premature menopause before the age of 40 was associated with a 36% increased risk of subsequent cardiovascular disease, even after taking into account conventional risk factors in a recent study from the UK Biobank. So I was very pleased in 2019, ACCHA primary prevention guideline that I was a pleasure of being a co-author on, that we highlighted these female specific risk factors of premature menopause and adverse pregnancy outcomes of preeclampsia as risk enhancing factors that would move women into a higher risk category where they might uh, warrant statin therapy or at least a more intensive focus on prevention. Additionally, um, inflammatory disorders such as psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, which are more common in women, were also highlighted as risk enhancing factors. Now, a lot of my work has focused on uh, sex hormone levels in postmenopausal women. Men um, have a gradual loss of testosterone over their lifetime, over decades. But in women, they have this acute life change that men don't experience with a subsequent loss of estrogen at the time of the menopause transition. And some of my prior work from the MESA study, we found that postmenopausal women with higher androgens, because the postmenopausal ovary still makes testosterone, that women with higher androgens related to estrogens had increased risk of subsequent cardiovascular disease and heart failure, even independent of traditional risk factors. And we showed that higher testosterone levels in postmenopausal women was also associated with multiple adverse phenotypes of adverse cardiac remodeling, aortic stiffness, reduced brachial reactivity, atherosclerosis progression, elevated BNP, cardiovascular events, and cognitive decline. It remains unclear what to do about this uh, exactly because clinical trials of hormone therapy after menopause, which I'll show you on a subsequent slide, have not been shown to reduce cardiovascular risk, but we did this research to help uh, provide some mechanistic understanding of the role of sex hormones in the development of cardiovascular disease in women. And although we're not measuring sex hormone levels clinically uh, right now, uh, sex hormone levels may potentially identify a higher risk women who may benefit from other risk reducing strategies, such as intensive lifestyle changes and potentially statin therapy. Now, as I mentioned, hormone therapy is not recommended after menopause for the sole purpose of cardiovascular disease prevention, and it has mixed effects. You know, the favorable effects is that estrogen therapy can lower LDL cholesterol and dilate blood vessels through a nitric oxide effect, but estrogen can also be prothrombotic and pro-inflammatory. So in older women, these adverse effects may outweigh any beneficial effects. And indeed, the landmark study, the Women's Health Initiative published in 2002, showed that women who were older on average with a mean age of 63, that estrogen plus progestin therapy compared to placebo had a nominally increased risk of cardiovascular events. So we're not recommending hormone therapy for cardiovascular disease prevention, but there are many women who have very symptomatic menopausal hot flashes, vasomotor or symptoms, and menopausal hormone therapy may be indicated for these women who are under the age of 60 or within 10 years of the onset of menopause, where the, the risk uh, seems to be very low, uh, for control of these vasomotor symptoms if they're refractory to lifestyle changes and non-hormonal therapy. Generally, menopausal therapy is not recommended for older women over 60 or if they're more than 10 years out from menopause, or in women who have a history of cardiovascular disease, venous thromboembolism, or other hypercoagulable states. So it's important to do an accurate um, cardiovascular risk assessment prior to the use of menopausal hormone therapy.
Now, there was an excellent review recently by Dr. Gina Lundberg, who outlined the risks of menopausal hormone therapy. And I won't go through this whole slide, uh, but menopausal hormone therapy may be acceptable for uh, lower risk women early uh, in the menopausal transition, uh, but again, to avoid in high risk women. And then for women who may have one or two risk factors or borderline risk, it really involves a clinician patient risk discussion. Now, one thing that I do in my practice, I get a lot of referrals for CV risk assessment for women considering menopausal therapy, is when risk is uncertain, I often get a coronary artery calcium score that we know from data such as this from the MESA study, that the coronary artery calcium score is very prognostic of risk in both women and men. And in the graph here on the left, the very light green line of a zero score, you can see over 10 years that women with a calcium score of zero have a very low risk of a future cardiovascular event. It's not a zero risk, but it's a low risk, about 0.1% per year. So potentially um, menopausal therapy might be safe in these women with no evidence of calcified atherosclerosis. On the other hand, scores above 300, the event rate is similar to secondary prevention women, and so I would avoid hormone therapy in these women. And again, coronary artery calcium is very useful for refining risk uh, for a number of reasons, but it really integrates both traditional risk factors, novel risk factors, genetics over a lifetime. And it's uh, a superior risk predictor because it's actually measuring the disease itself, atherosclerosis. Now, in terms of therapy, I had the pleasure to work with Dr. Leslie Show and uh, Annabel Vogelman on this review recently published in Jack about primary prevention in women. Um, in terms of statin recommendations for primary prevention, um, they're similar to men. Um, so again, you would use statins for secondary prevention, for primary hyperlipidemia, for diabetes, and high-risk primary prevention. Uh, you might consider it in uh, borderline risk women who have risk enhancers as part of a risk discussion. But generally, statins could be avoided in very low-risk women or women who are pregnant or intending to become pregnant in the next one to two months. Now, high-risk women who need a statin, um, you wouldn't avoid it entirely in childbearing years. You wouldn't not treat a woman with FH, uh, but they would need to be on oral contraceptives. And then at the time that they desire starting their family, you would withdraw the statin at the time of uh, conception, pregnancy, and breastfeeding. But you wouldn't withhold statins for the decades of childbearing years if they had a compelling indication. In terms of aspirin, again, you'd still use it in secondary prevention in women. Um, but generally, healthy women with no major risk factors or older healthy women above 70 or those at risk for bleeding, you wouldn't use aspirin for primary prevention. And then aspirin might be considered in those women and men who have significant subclinical atherosclerosis or smokers or a family history, again, as part of a risk discussion. I just want to highlight some um, recent papers that I worked on with Dr. Khan and Dr. Khan, where we looked over decades of clinical trial enrollment in lipid lowering therapy and cardiometabolic clinical trials. And we found that women were still under enrolled in these trials relative to the disease burden in the population. So this impairs the generalizability of, in, of these uh, efficacy and safety results into clinical practice. And so I would encourage those of you um, uh, involved in trials to make sure that we continue to try to enroll adequate number of women in trials. And then I just want to end with this other study where I worked with Dr. Victor Okunra-Timmy using a national survey data from the US. Uh, we looked at individuals with cardiovascular disease and looked at patient reported outcomes. And we found that even after you looked for demographics and comorbidities and risk factors, that women with cardiovascular disease compared to men were more likely to report that they had poor communication with their doctors and that their doctors didn't listen to them or respect them or spend enough time with them. And women were more likely to report a poor uh, experience with, with their health care. Now, those were patient reported outcomes, but we did look at pharmacy data for statins and reported use of aspirin. And we found that women in secondary prevention were undertreated as well. So, in other words, women were getting suboptimal care and they felt that way too. So, in summary, my takeaway points are that. There are unique risk factors to women across their lifespan that you should consider for prevention. Particularly, it's important to take a reproductive history, consider adverse pregnancy outcomes, premature menopause, um, hormone therapy, um, that women should get appropriate guideline-directed cardiovascular prevention therapy, 
to consider risk enhancers, and if risk is uncertain, coronary calcium scores can be helpful to refine risk. Make sure we enroll women in trials and to listen to women when they tell us that something is wrong. And thank you again very much for having me part of this webinar. Thank you very much, Erin, for this impressive presentation. Thank you. Uh, I would just like to remind you that uh, more than uh, 650 people subscribe to this webinar. And if you cannot watch it in, uh, in live, you will see it in, uh, on replay uh, in, on YouTube. You will receive the link uh, via our newsletter. Um, I will uh, pass the word uh, to Professor Atul Patak, uh, which is the head of uh, the cardiology department. Um, of uh, the Centre Hospitalier Princesse de Grasse at Monaco. Uh, he's also the Vice President of the French Society of Hypertension, and he's also the President of the European Society for Patient Care. Thank you very much, dear Atul, for accepting our invitation. You have the word. Your presentation is uh, 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 entitled Approach to Treatment of Orthostatic Hypotension and Nocturnal Hypertension. Thank you. Are you able to listen to me? Yeah. Yeah. So um, again, great to see all, all of you, uh, friends, colleagues, uh, through the internet, and uh, Sergio and yourself, Alexandru, looking that you are safe. Uh, yeah, well, I'm going to go into something which is um, of uh, concern for cardiologists uh, because it's a very practical question. Uh, and I will start my story by reminding you how do you define orthostatic hypotension. Now, the definition of orthostatic hypotension is very simple. It's a manometric definition. It's a hemodynamic definition where in any patient, uh, if you see a drop in his blood pressure of 20 millimeters of mercury for systolic blood pressure and or diastolic blood pressure reduction by 10 millimeters of mercury, well, you have a patient with orthostatic hypotension. Symptoms are not required. So the, the concept of talking about mild or severe orthostatic hypotension is totally wrong. There are no mild or severe orthostatic hypotension. You have or you do not have orthostatic hypotension. And this should occur during the first three minutes after standing. This is really important because if you wait too long, you are entering in other diseases which are not really orthostatic hypotension. The key message here, and I'm really insisting about that, is if you're looking, if you are looking for orthostatic hypotension, you have to measure blood pressure, and at the same time, you have to measure heart rate. This is the most important step, allowing you to understand why your patient is having orthostatic hypotension. So, simple definition, a drop in blood pressure, systolic or diastolic, 20, 10 millimeters of mercury within the first three minutes after standing, and no symptoms are required, and you have to measure heart rate at the same time. Why is the measurement of heart rate so important? Because there are two types of patients with orthostatic hypotension. Patients who have orthostatic hypotension with an increase in heart rate have a totally normal barrel reflex uh, functioning appropriately. And in this case, hypotension is usually related to a condition which is very easy to treat dehydration, anemia, venous insufficiency, let's say any condition uh, leading to real or relative hypovolemia. So whatever is reducing blood pressure, whatever is reducing your volume will be leading to hypotension associated with an increase of heart rate because your barrel reflex is working totally normally. And if you identify the cause and you treat the cause, orthostatic hypotension will disappear. The second type of patients are patients where, while they're having orthostatic hypotension, heart rate should increase, but it's not increased at all. This is what we call neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. And in this case, you are facing a, a, a more complex situation because these patients have a lack in the functioning of the bar reflex arch. And these are usually patients with neurological disorders. I, I'll go a little bit deeper, deeper into this uh, later on. So this is really important. Look at blood pressure and look at heart rate. If heart is increased, you are having secondary orthostatic hypotension. You have to find the cause. You can treat it and orthostatic hypotension will disappear. 
If heart rate is not increased appropriately, you have a neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. So why is the measurement of heart rate so important? And why is the timing so important? Because for example, if you see a drop in orthostatic hypotension at the very early beginning, which disappears within the first three minutes, well, you usually have something called transient intolerance to orthostatism. On the other side, if you have a patient who is having elevated heart rate from the very early beginning, and is even having an increase in heart rate of more than 30 beats per minute, you might have, be, have been uh, able to identify a patient with POTS, which is the, the acronym for postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. On the other side, if blood pressure goes down after three minutes, there are, it's, it's a strong signal for imagining that your patient is having vagal syncope or vagal abnormality. So the timing, the measurement of blood pressure and the concomitant measurement of heart rate will allow you to really not only distinguish between secondary and neurogenic orthostatic hypotension, but also help you to further uh, have a better diagnosis in your patient and also offer him the best treatment. Now, these are the usually general clinical situation, which are often requiring specialized investigation. So in your office, if you have a patient with orthostatic hypotension who is not having an increase in his heart rate, it means he's having some kind of neurological condition underlying orthostatic hypotension. So primary neurological disorder, for example, dopamine beta hydroxylase deficiency, it's a genetic disorder where patients are unable to produce enough uh, neuromediator, enough catecholamine, so they are unable to have correct level of neuromediator, able to maintain a vasoconstrictive tone, but also familial dysautonomia, and more generally what we call C-nucleinopathy. It's a general name for disorders which are happening at the level of the central nervous system. Uh, you've heard maybe about shy driver disease, pure autonomic failure, uh, the Lewis body disease, or even Parkinson disease. So these are diseases where you have neurogenic orthostatic hypotension because primarily your neurological system is having uh, some kind of disease. Sometimes the neurological uh, afferences or efferences or the central nervous systems could be damaged by another disease. These are secondary causes of neurogenic hypotension, for example, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, but also inflammatory disorders, infectious diseases, cancer, these are conditions where you might have abnormalities in your neuro, neurogenic uh, uh, arches, neurogenic reflexes leading to neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. For clinicians, sometimes when you see a patient with orthostatic hypotension and you want to be sure that he's having some kind of neurogenic participation, you might ask your patient about these symptoms affecting any part of the body. Because what is behind neurogenic orthostatic hypotension is dysautonomia, which means a kind of lesion of the autonomic nervous system, whether the afferent part or the efferent part, at the presynaptic level or at the postsynaptic level. So any tissue could be affected. Hair loss, dry skin, eyesight loss, difficulty in swallowing, but also any type of GI transit disorders, urinary disorders, sexual dysfunction. So you just need to exchange and ask the patient if he's, he has seen any type of changes in any part of his body because you know that the functional anatomy of the autonomic nervous system, it's, it's a widespread system where any type of organ is receiving some kind of uh, uh, autonomic innovation. Now, am I just talking about something rare, something strange we uh, might not see? Well, not so sure because when you look at the prevalence of orthostatic hypotension, for example, in this large cohort, which is the cardiovascular health study, you see that the amount of patients who are having uh, orthostatic hypotension is increasing with uh, the age of the patient included in this trial. But is it expected that above 65 years old, in above 65 years old patient, the prevalence of orthostatic hypotension is something between 15 and 25%. So it's quite prevalent uh, when you see elderly patients. What is really important is that if you have a clinical suspicion of orthostatic hypotension, if you feel that your patient is having orthostatic hypotension, you have to repeat sometimes the measurement. The prevalence of, of being able to detect orthostatic hypotension is usually associated with the number of measurements. In this study um, uh, published uh, in a cohort of geriatric patients, the, 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 the simple uh, 
measurement repeated at least six to seven times would be able to better identify almost double the prevalence of orthostatic hypotension. In elderly patients, sometimes where it's difficult to make these patients stand up, you can also ask the patient to move from a lying position to a sitting position. And by doing that, you are also able to detect orthostatic hypotension. So do not think that uh, the prevalence of orthostatic hypotension is low. Second, there are some uh, consequences of having orthostatic hypotension. We have seen that uh, in these patients, you might have a cognitive impairment, especially in elderly, but also cerebral lesions with silent cerebral infarcts, but also white matter lesions. So it's not just a, a problem of blood pressure, but low blood pressure is also directly affecting target organ damage like the brain, but also other situations. Now, what is really interesting, and this is linking my talk to the second part of my talk, which is orthostatic hypotension and supine hypertension, is that when you look, for example, at the hemodynamic parameters according to the orthostatic hypotension status in this cohort of almost 1,000 patients, look here, on the right side of the slide, those of the patients having orthostatic hypotension are also those with more elevated blood pressure. So you might be surprised they're having lower blood pressure or higher blood pressure. Well, orthostatic hypotension is an event, and you will be able to see this event if you record blood pressure for 24 hours using ABPM. But generally, orthostatic hypotension is associated with elevated blood pressure when your patients are lying down. Why? Because we are talking, again, about a neurological disorder. So supine hypertension and orthostatic hypotension are both inducing target organ damage, and this will lead to an increased risk of mortality. So orthostatic hypotension is a huge risk factor for mortality. And if you look at the cause of uh, death in these patients, most of these patients are dying from cardiovascular diseases uh, more than other, other uh, conditions. The second uh, major cause of death in these patients are injuries because of the fall. Now, coming back to the slide, I told you that if you follow a cohort of patients with orthostatic hypotension and you measure blood pressure in this patient, you will see that their blood pressure, their average blood pressure will be elevated. Why that? Because if you follow these patients, you will see that almost one-fifth of these patients will have a combination of supine hypertension. And supine hypertension is not nocturnal hypertension. Whenever these patients lay down, their blood pressure will increase. It's again related to this abnormal functioning and abnormal autonomic uh, functioning, what we call dysautonomia. So if you want to correct supine hypertension, you have to correct orthostatic hypertension, and the best would be to correct the neurological underlying disease. This is what you usually see in an ambulatory blood pressure measurement recording. Uh, if you follow the patient and the recording starts at eight o'clock in the morning, you will see that he is experiencing some kind of orthostatic hypertension episode. Here, for example, after meal, that's a classical time, postprandial orthostatic hypertension. Or here, he's in fact here having a nap. And when he's lying down, his blood pressure is increased, that's supine hypertension. And when he's waking up from his nap, he's having orthostatic hypotension. And then during night, again, he's laying, laying down, and that's during the night period, supine hypertension. So this is really important. 50% of cases with orthostatic hypotension do have supine hypertension. So whenever they lay down, they will have increase of blood pressure. And this is sometimes very difficult because when you look at the patient and when you are not looking for orthostatic hypertension, you will examine the patient while he's laying down in your office and you will say he's having hypertension and you will treat his supine hypertension. And by doing so, you are worsening his orthostatic hypertension you have, you have been unable to detect while you, while you examine the patient. So this topic about orthostatic hypertension and supine hypertension is really important because it's very common in this patient with neurogenic orthostatic hypertension. And the, the reason why these uh, two abnormalities are linked it's because of autonomic dysfunction. So when your patient is laying down, his blood pressure should go down because he's resting, but he's having exactly the opposite. His blood pressure is going up. And when your patient is standing up, his blood pressure so slightly go down and then be normalized, but because he's having autonomic dysfunction, his blood pressure is going down. And the risk is that these diseases are promoting not only cardiovascular, but also renal diseases. And the other very complicated thing is that whenever you treat one thing, you will, you will have a, a kind of complication, which is that the other diseases will be amplified. 
If you treat orthostatic hypotension by giving drugs which are increasing blood pressure, you will increase supine hypertension. If you treat supine hypertension by giving drugs which are decreasing blood pressure, you are worsening orthostatic hypertension. And that's why I think it's a very practical and important clinical question. So the diagnostic of supine hypertension is very easy. It's hypertension in supine position. So if you have elevated blood pressure in a patient who is in a supine position, it's supine hypertension. But your reflex should be then to look for orthostatic hypertension. It's related to neurodegenerative diseases. And one out of two of these patients who are having supine hypertension are also having orthostatic hypertension. But the difficult part is that sometimes blood pressure can be normal in seated position and delay diagnosis. You might find nocturnal hypertension, but not seated hypertension. And because of the fall in blood pressure, you might sometimes think that your patient is not having elevated blood pressure. So do you need to treat this patient? Well, this is very difficult because the level of evidence is very low. Most of the time, these patients are excluded from trial. The patients who are having orthostatic hypertension are excluded from trial, and the patients who are having supine hypertension are excluded from trial. So what we do is we extrapolate data from hypertension trials to these patients with supine hypertension. The other very difficult uh, situation is that when you measure uh, ambulatory blood pressure, and when you only look at 24-hour blood pressure measurement, you might be falsely uh, induced in believing that the patient is having normal blood pressure because orthostatic hypotension is compensating supine hypertension. And so the mean value will be normal while the patient is having huge variability. So always look at the variability uh, measurement in your ABPM data. If the variability, the standard deviation of blood pressure is above 15 millimeters of mercury, then you have to look at the chronogram and see if your patient is having orthostatic hypotension and supine hypertension. Now, the first thing is that if you want to treat this patient, you have to avoid supine hypertension uh, during day. So that's very easy. If your patient is having a nap, you will ask your patient to try to keep his legs at a lower level than his body. So avoid to have his legs at the level of the body, avoid to have his legs at the upper part and at an upper part than his body, but try to have his, his leg uh, lying down. Avoid to use any type of pressure agent. So if you treat orthostatic hypertension with pressure agent, you will increase the risk of supine hypertension during day. And finally, what is really important is to try to treat the neurological condition. Why? Because the patient who have a neurogenic orthostatic hypertension are very sensitive. They have what we call vascular hypersensitivity. They have also this impaired bar reflex buffering. And so they are prone to have very elevated hypertension when you treat orthostatic hypertension. So other very small tips you could use in this patient with supine hypertension is usually to uh, uh, offer this patient pressure agent for orthostatic hypertension, but not before bedtime. You will treat orthostatic hypertension during day and you will avoid treating orthostatic hypertension after 4 p.m. You will try to avoid drinking too much water during meals because this will also increase uh, blood pressure after the meal. And you might use very funny things, which is drinking a glass of alcohol before going to, to sleep. So a glass of red wine. I know Sergio enjoys it. And having a, a, a piece of chocolate because the, and I know Alexandro enjoys it, because chocolate and wine before bedtime are a very easy way to decrease blood pressure and avoid orthostatic hypotension in this patient. And it's very rare as a cardiologist to tell your patient, I have a very good option for you. Have a piece of chocolate and a glass of red wine before going to bed if you want to avoid supine hypertension and do not worsen orthostatic hypertension. Finally, in the last two minutes, I would like just to give some uh, tips about the treatment, the pharmacological treatment of this very complicated question. Well, as I told you, um, sometimes uh, if you look at ABPM in these patients who are having supine hypertension and orthostatic hypotension, if the patient's profile is still a dipper profile, it means that the blood pressure is going down for more than 10% during night in comparison with daytime values. And if you are even having an early morning blood pressure decrease, then you shouldn't treat supine hypertension because the regulation is still working in these patients. The second very important message is that the response to blood pressure lowering drug is very different in these patients. They are very sensitive to vasodilatatory agents 
and they are not at all sensitive to beta blocking agent. Third, you have to take into account the neurological disorder. If the neurological disorder is affecting the central nervous system, you might use drugs, and especially clonidine, which is a very interesting drug. But in contrario, if your patient is having peripheral autonomic degeneration, for example, diabetes, or pure autonomic failure, you will not use clonidine because you remember clonidine is a alpha-2, is a central alpha-2 agonist, but it's a peripheral alpha blocker. So if you're having a peripheral destruction of the nerve, you will not have the alpha blocking effect in the periphery. You will only have the central alpha-2 agonist effect, which will induce a paradoxical increase in blood pressure. Finally, sometimes you have to play with chronopharmacology. You might use functional uh, nitric oxide uh, vasodilatatory drugs, for example, nitrate patch in the evening, for example, sildenafil in the evening. You might even use chronopharmacological features, and there have been studies looking at the effect of losartan, 25 milligrams or 50 milligrams just before bedtime, but not captopril. You might use clonidine, and you might use a short-acting calcium channel block. So in conclusion, what I really wanted to emphasize is that whenever you see a patient with supine hypertension, you have to look for orthostatic hypertension. Whenever you see a patient with orthostatic hypertension, you have to look for supine hypertension and that the use of 24 uh, hour recording is key in the diagnostic assessment of this very complicated co condition. When you find a patient with orthostatic hypertension, always measure heart rate because this will allow you to guide and guide you towards the neurogenic orthostatic hypertension, usually a complex neurological disorder, which is behind the scene, or a very easy to treat uh, disorder. Finally, if you want to treat this patient, you have to focus on both orthostatic hypertension and supine hypertension, knowing that when you are treating one, you are having a bad effect on the other condition. So we have to play with these small tips and tricks in order to control blood pressure because Controlling blood pressure is key in order to avoid target organ damage. But what is really most important is to be able to identify the neurological disorder in order to treat the neurological disorder. If you treat Parkinson's disease, orthostatic hypertension and supine hypertension will uh, slightly disappear and you will reduce by that the cardiovascular risk of your patient. And by that, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm open for questions. Well, thank you, Atul for this wonderful presentation and uh, uh, surely we'll have a lot of questions uh, for the end of the uh, webinar. But now I'd like to introduce the last our last talk, Professor Peter Landsberg, Professor University Medical Center in Groningen, New Holland. Groningen is very important for me because my son did his Master of Science there at Groningen and now he's in Brussels. And uh, He's from the Department of Pediatrics, uh, Molecular Genetics section. And his talk will be about uh, atorvastatin 20 milligrams. Why is it not enough? So Peter, please. Thank you very much, Sergio. I'm going to share my screen. Let's see if I can, yes. Is it working? No, not, not yet. Not yet? Let me no problem. share. Great. Yeah? Yes. Just a second. Um, lipid management. And I chose this picture of a Zen garden. This is the famous uh, Zen garden in Kyoto because it reflects simplicity, essence, and the, the uniqueness of simple elements that are relevant. And I think it's important to, to bring that up again
um, for, for lipid management. Although there is a lot of new exciting data from new trials and new type of formulations, <clears throat> having a basic understanding of, of why cholesterol needs to be managed, what are targets, and how to properly address that. So these are my exposures. I'm doing I'm giving a lot of presentation for different societies and also for different companies. So oh, Peter, uh, I'm sorry for interrupting you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you can just disconnect uh, the um, uh, the screen because uh, we can see like a pop up uh, Zoom uh, thing that is um, uh, is showing like the settings of Zoom. They are showing on your presentation. Like if you can just How about now? disconnect and uh, close the Zoom settings. Yeah, it's great now. Now it's good. Okay, I removed it. Um, so getting back to my story, um, these medical education set settings are of course um, focusing on increasing your knowledge and understanding and, and hopefully that is something that you will embrace and ultimately use in your clinical practice to improve patient management. However, uh, one of the basic challenges that we're facing is that changing attitudes is much more difficult. Changing the way we did things uh, to new ways is a challenge, even though the evidence and, and the logic seems quite uh, acceptable. Um, taking that extra leap in doing what I think is more relevant, or more important, does make it, uh, make it a little bit more challenging. So these are the three main topics I want to discuss today, which is uh, normal. In other words, if we want to reduce something, we first have to determine if it's abnormal. And I think that is one of the major challenges when discussing cholesterol. That for many people, and sometimes even doctors, they feel that cholesterol is already normal, so why should you reduce it? Then a concept of burden. It's, it's a cholesterol burden that we have to deal with, and that brings a broader context of uh, what is happening over a lifetime. And finally, why targets are so important. Um, we're now living in the era of, of uh, alternate facts, uh, uh, reality that is not being accepted by critics. We have the anti-faxers, and we also have cholesterol critics and statin skeptics. I just wanted to highlight the incredible amount of evidence, the burden of evidence we have on cholesterol lowering and on statins. Uh, this is a article by the European Atherosclerosis Society, sort of combining all that evidence and showing that we have over 200 large clinical trials, more than 2 million participants, more than 20 million patient year follow-up, and over 150,000 car 150, cardiovascular events. So there is a lot of evidence that underlines that cholesterol is a risk factor and that reducing cholesterol is something that reduces that risk. Um, so what is normal? What is in normal cholesterol? And let me take that to a little bit of a broader context. What is a normal risk factor? So if we talk about hypertension and we talk about systolic blood pressure, I think everybody agrees that 120 is the optimal level. And if the level is higher than that, it's considered abnormal because it's associated with disease. And even if it's lower than that, it can also be associated with disease. And 120 is the sweet spot because that is associated with health. We have a similar approach for, for glucose. We have a similar approach for temperature. But for cholesterol, intriguingly, we have a different approach. For cholesterol, what we did is we measured in a lot of people the amount of cholesterol in their blood and then said this is the median in this population or the mean we take two standard deviations to the left and the right and that is then the normal distribution but if you would take that same definition that i just gave you for for hypertension and glucose i think the situation would be quite different and then what now is considered normal might actually be considered abnormal and to highlight my point, uh, I'd like to share this slide with you. This is a slide I often use because it makes an important observation. Uh, you see three graphs. The bottom one is for humans. The middle one 
is for pigs and the top one is for sheep. On the y-axis, you can see the milligrams of total cholesterol and on the x-axis, three phases, suckling, no, fetal, suckling, and adulthood. And you can see that the suckling or no, the fetal level of cholesterol is very similar in these three mammals. And I can explain to you that it's similar in almost all mammals. Now, at birth, a big change takes place. And one of the changes is that you start using uh, mother's milk as a source of your nutrition. And mother's milk, by its nature, is high in fat, high in sugar, high in all kinds of important nutrients. And what happens is that in all mammals, cholesterol level goes up. However, in sheep and pigs, after suckling period, mom kicks them out and the young sheep and young pigs will start eating what young sheep and young pigs eat. But in humans, after the suckling period, mother will start feeding you with cow's milk and after cow's milk, a Western diet or perhaps even the Happy Meals from McDonald's. So what happens then is that your cholesterol level stays high or even increases. Intriguingly, if you do the same nutritional experiment with the other animals, a similar thing will happen and you will also see very high cholesterol levels in such a Western diet situation. Now, the problem is that having that level of cholesterol, which is not physiologic, translates already at an early age into changes in your atherosclerosis, in your coronary arteries. And to illustrate that, this is a, a slice from a coronary artery of a young boy, three years old, who died in a car accident. And they did a post-mortem examination. And as you can observe, already there is the first sign of atherosclerosis. It's a fatty streak. Now, let me explain quite clearly. This was not a boy with familiar hypercholesterolemia. He didn't have diabetes. He didn't have hypertension. I don't think he smoked. So the only observable risk factor was probably a normal, between brackets, cholesterol level. Now, this is not unique. This is data from the Bogolu Heart Study, an old program that looked at premature atherosclerosis in young children or adolescents. And you can see that in this cohort, already 50% of the two to 15 year olds had presence of fatty streaks. And one in 10 almost already had presence of coronary atheromas. So it is quite clear that having this level that we think is normal is actually already associated with disease. Now, last point I would like to show you is that if you look at people that are very healthy, that have no risk factors, healthy diet, exercise, no diabetes, no hypertension, and you start um, trying to find signs of atherosclerosis using non-invasive imaging techniques, so carotid IMT or femoral IMT measurements, they found that in most of the individual studies, there were already signs of atherosclerosis. And not only in one, but sometimes in two and more vascular beds. The only group that was exempt, you can see here on the far left side, those were the ones with LDL below 60 milligrams per deciliter. So that again points out towards this sort of physiological level that is in the range between 30 and 50 milligrams. Now, after determining normal and what causes atherosclerosis, of course, it's a combination of risk factors, but I want to highlight the importance of cholesterol from a different perspective. And I think most of you are familiar with the, with the concept of pack year smoking. If you smoke one package of cigarette per day for one year, it's considered one pack year. After 35 pack years, you're not talking about if you get lung cancer, it's more when the lung cancer will manifest. We have tried to come up with a similar concept for cholesterol. And in cholesterol, the 35 pack years is actually nine grams of cholesterol exposure over lifetime. So 9,000 milligrams. Now, if you take an individual with an average LDL cholesterol of say 150 milligrams, then it would take roughly 60 years to reach that threshold of nine grams. If there is a child with homozygous FH with 
very high levels of LDL cholesterol, in this case 900, then it would manifest after approximately 10 years. And that's exactly what we see. And if you have good luck and you have a genetic change that is associated with slightly lower LDL cholesterol, say 100, then it might take you 90 years to reach that threshold. Now, to illustrate that in a practical, in a practical fashion, um, I'll share one of my patients with you. This is a simple 40-year-old guy who comes and says, you know, I want to make sure that I don't die of cardiovascular disease very young. So I want to live at least in 80 years. So you measure his cholesterol, it's 150. He is 40, so that means he already has six grams under his belt. Now, if you want to ensure that he doesn't reach that threshold, that means he got 3,000 milligrams left over a period of 40 years. Now, dividing that means that you have a target LDL of 75 milligrams to reach the, 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 um, the three gram target. That means you need a 50% reduction from 150 to 75. So that would be achieved with 80 milligrams of the thermostat. Now, had he come earlier, say in his 20s, then after 20 years, there were three grams under his belt. So he's got six grams left over a period of 60 years. So that means the remaining 60 years, 100 milligrams would be sufficient to avoid that cardiovascular event until his 80s. He has now 150, so he needs to reduce that by approximately 30% and 50 milligrams. So that would be 20 milligrams of the thermostat. However, had he come 10 years later, when he was already 50, and he had already seven and a half grams under his belt, that means we now need a 65% reduction. So that would be a combination of 80 milligrams of atorvastatin plus 10 milligrams of ezetimibe. So this is just to illustrate that it's not just a measurement as a single time point, but it's sort of a calculation of the exposure over a lifetime that really determines uh, the, the aggressiveness of atherosclerosis in terms of symptoms and also how to manage it. Now, one of the discussions I often have is um, that very commonly, the most prescribed dosage in statin is actually a torvastatin 20 milligrams. I travel a lot, so when I ask this question, what is most commonly prescribed in, in this country or this area, if it's in Asia or if it's in Africa or Europe or North America or South America, very often it's, we, we use 20 milligrams of a torvastatin quite regularly. That's our preferred dosage. Now, again, showing you some old data, this is the S study. This was the first study conducted with statins that was a spectacular result at the American Heart in 1994. And what was shown that in the placebo group, LDL was 190. Event rate over four years was 28%. But the ones that used simvastatin were able to reduce their LDL to 122 and an event rate of 19.4%. So there was almost a 30% reduction in LDL, 30% reduction in events. Most commonly used dosage was 20 to 40 milligrams of simvastatin, which is the equivalent of 20 milligrams of atorvastatin, more or less. If we jump now 10 years ahead and look at the TNT study, this was not a placebo controlled trial anymore, but a low dosage of 10 milligram versus a high dosage of 80 milligram. And we see here in the comparator that with 10 milligrams, it was possible to reach an LDL of 101 and an event rate of approximately 8.3%. While the ones that were treated with 80 milligrams had an LDL of 77 and an event rate of 6.7. And the simple conclusion that follows from this trial, that if you want to have your event rate reduced from 28% to 6.7%, it's very simple. You give a high dose, high intensity, or 80 milligrams of atorvastat. Based on all these clinical trials, and in the last decade, we've not seen only statin trials, but the addition of ezetimibe to statins and PCSK9 antibodies, and very consistently lower LDLs were associated with lower risk 
So we now have the new European guidelines that state if you are a very high risk patient, so a patient with cardiovascular disease, our new target is now 55 milligrams or 1.4 millimole per liter to achieve an optimal LDL cholesterol. And again, to, to make it a little bit more practical uh, and to illustrate the impact, I always use this slide, which was a study conducted in Italy, in Rome, by a, a colleague and friend, Dr. Colivici. Um, and in 2008, 2009, when he did this trial, the European guidelines was actually focusing on less than 100 as target. He was not convinced that less than 100 was actually sufficient. So he said, I'm going to randomize my patients, and he used 290 non-STEMI patients. Um, these were patients not amenable for any intervention, so they had most likely uh, small vessel disease, um, and these are patients with diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And then they were randomized to a treat to target, so less than 100 was achieved with an average dosage of atorvastatin of 24.8. So let's say 20 milligram. And the other half got 80 milligrams of atorvastatin. This was the LDL achieved in the ones were titrated. This was the LDL with the standard dosage actually below 70 and close to 55. What happened? And this is after one year of treatment. These were the event rates in the two treatment arms. 26.7% and 16%. In other words, there was almost a 50% reduction by simply using, instead of a 20 milligram standard dosage that everybody embraces, a more effective 80 milligram of atorvastatin. Now, if we add on some new data from the uh, IMPROVE IT trial, um, then we would add ezetimibe to this patient, and that would put their LDL more in the level of what we see in uh, uh, of the new targets below 55, and that would reduce their risk with approximately 10%. Now, to summarize my talk, I use the acronym of HELP, not to get help, but to give help. And I also show um, a picture of my ex-girlfriend. Um, when I met her, I introduced her to toothpaste, and she was ecstatic because she said, oh my God, now I can save my teeth. And I said, I'm sorry, you can save your tooth because you only got one left. But she was still very happy. And what I'm trying to bring across with this meme is that is exactly how we treat atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease. We wait until there's one tooth left and then we start aggressively treating it. And I think the better approach is to start much earlier like what we do with teeth. We start brushing our teeth when we have the first teeth coming out and make sure we keep our chunkers for the rest of our life, maybe until we're 78 or even longer. So let's get back to HELP. HELP stands for high intensity, high dose statins. E stands for early prevention, earlier is better. And of course, the addition of ezetimibe particularly in the high-risk patient, and especially if you want to achieve the new targets. L stands for long-term. Uh, lipid management is not a short-term intervention. It's a lifelong intervention and aiming for the lower LDL targets dictated by the guidelines. Last but not least, patient participation. We need to have trust of our patient. We need to know that our patient really understands and follows our advice and adheres to the medication that we prescribe. And last but not least, new treatments like PCSK9 antibodies are available now and seem to be very effective, safe in getting patients to these new targets, even when they're not really that tolerant to uh, high dose, high intensity statins and or ezetimibe. So this was my last slide. Uh, these are my contact details. Sergio, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. And like everybody else, I'm very open to, to answer questions. Obrigado. Oh. Obrigado, de nada. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. And well, since one of the problems of uh, uh, webinars is that the, the audience, you can hear the, audi the applauses from the audience. So I will <laughs> applaud all the panelists. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. So, uh, Peter, uh, it's, it's so updated your presentation. I would start with you because, you know, two days ago, 
there was a retrospective study led by uh, uh, Professor M uh, Michel Facou from uh, Toronto. It involved like almost 1 million people followed for five years, all of them with previous CVD, either uh, cere cerebral or polyvascular or coronary disease, and in 30% with a pure peripheral artery disease, only peripheral artery disease, only 50% were taking statins. And worse than that, in this group, in this group of patients, okay, only 15% were taking high potency statins like a total statin 80 or a super statin 40. I mean, whose fault is this? I mean, Peter, do you have an idea? Why is it so bad? Who I, 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 I can speculate. I think th there is a few factors that play a, a major part. Um, first of all, I think doctors have been sort of neglecting to, to feel confident with the information that I just presented, you know, the data we have from clinical trials, and they feel that it's more prudent to use not the maximum dosage. Now, what they don't realize is that they're harming their patient even more because I think statins are the safest drug that we have in our complete armamentarium. I'm talking about serious side effects are extremely rare and over 300 million people are using statins. Statins have been around for 30 years. And in those 30 years, the serious side effects and the, 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 the really uh, harmful side effects are still rhabdomyolysis or fatal rhabdomyolysis. That's one in 10 to 100,000 patients. That's one in a million patients. Yes, sometimes there are tolerability issues, but becoming aware of the impact of not doing what is proper, instead of focusing too much on the harmful effect that might occur with using high dose, high intensity statin, I think is an important point. Second important point is that there is a lot of misinformation on the internet. You know, there is a lot of flack from, even from well-renowned scientists that criticize cholesterol, basically because they always put a lot of emphasis on total mortality. You know, statins don't reduce total mortality, so why should we use it? And I think that's not a very good argument because total mortality is something that needs larger studies and needs longer follow-up to, to determine that. And the second important point is we, we became so good in making sure that if patients make it to the hospital, you know, we, can, we can save them. <clears throat> we can make sure that they don't die. I remember when I was student doctor, you know, the, the, the CCU was a morgue, you know, out of the 100 patients that came in, maybe 40 or 50 came out alive. Now these days, it's everybody comes out alive. So people don't have that, that, that drive that they think, ah, oh, cardiovascular disease is something that we really need to be treating aggressively. And they feel very complacent, like I said in the beginning, because, you know, everybody has the same cholesterol. Why should I lower it? And I hear all these other information saying that cholesterol shouldn't be low, that statins are unsafe. And I think that combination is, is really a lethal combination for high-risk individuals. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Alex, would you like to uh, address the next question? Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Thank you very much, Sergio. So Sergio started the discussion session. Uh, thank you, Peter, for this excellent presentation. Uh, I will, I will uh, ask Erin a few questions. Um, and we're approaching the, the end of our webinar. We should finish in about 10 minutes. So dear Erin, um, can you just please detail on what would be the approach to statin intolerance in, in women? And the second question uh, would be, uh, what, what would be the role of the uh, coronary artery calcium in women uh, with risk enhancers? All right, great questions, thank you. So you heard from this excellent presentation by Peter about the benefit of statins and that they're safe and well tolerated. But nonetheless, certainly in the vein of a lot of my clinical practice is patients that come that perceive statin-associated um, muscle side effects, and these tend to be more common in women. So in terms of the approach, of, of first of all, you know, we, I do risk assessment to, to determine you know, the, the need. So uh, individuals at higher absolute risk benefit the most. So they clearly in secondary prevention, uh, there's a strong indication. 
Um, but in a primary prevention, if there's risk uncertain, this, these are cases that I might get a coronary calcium score because if the score is zero, especially in an older individual, they would be at predicted much lower risk and derive less potential benefit from statins. And so maybe we don't need to push as hard with that and maybe even defer statins if, if the calcium score is zero, which is the approach that was suggested um, in the recent AHA ACC cholesterol guidelines. So in individuals, though, that have an indication for statins, you know, I, I try, it's all about building trust, because um, a lot of times the, the symptoms are really not related to the statin at all. So I, I start low, I start slow, I try to get them on some statins, you know, once a week, twice a week, I think any statin is better than no statin, try to build this relationship, you know, we'll add a zetamide, um, and certainly in higher risk patients with secondary prevention or FH, we have PCSK9 inhibitors. Um, Bempidoic acid has, uh, although we don't have outcome data yet for that, but that's uh, emerged as a potential um, in our tool for LDL lowering because it does not have the statin associated muscle side effects that statins can have. But I would find that the vast majority of my patients who come to me with statin intolerance, I would get 80 to 90% of them on some statins. You know, we try different ones and doses. Most patients can tolerate a rechallenge. And I also think coronary calcium scores are very helpful in these patients because seeing is believing. And I've had a number of patients who didn't want to take a statin. And then when actually shown pictures of their own arteries by cardiac CT, and I say, you know, this is the plaque in your arteries, uh, they became a lot more convinced and a lot more worried and a lot more inclined to, to work with me and consider a statin therapy. But I think the main message is that statins are safe and effective and cheap. Um, and most patients do tolerate on a rechallenge if you work with them and build trust in patients. But in high risk patients, we do have a lot of emerging options that we can add of non statin therapy. In terms of the second question, it kind of ties to that. So the, uh, in primary prevention, the guidelines gave a number of risk enhancing factors, such as those of premature menopause and adverse pregnancy outcomes that would move um, patients into a higher risk category. Um, you know, one could consider as part of a clinician risk discussion just to start statins in these groups with risk enhancers, just because statins are safe and effective. Um, but again, I have a lot of patients that have somewhat statin reluctance. And so in these patients with risk enhancers, I do find often the coronary calcium score uh, by non-contrast CT, very low radiation, a fairly inexpensive test, um, can help further risk stratify individuals and help guide uh, patient clinician risk discussions about the, the expected uh, benefit from statin therapy in these individuals. Okay, thank you. And uh, well, actually, uh, I have a question to Atul, which goes in line with the question that was uh, uh, made by the audience. Uh, so it's uh, about the same thing because, you know, first of all, it's interesting, interesting uh, to uh, uh, point out that just waiting three minutes, you know, to take the blood pressure of the patient standing can prevent many patients to undergo a tilt table test because you have the diagnosis immediately, right? But um, so there, would, there should be, uh, which, which in your opinion should be um, a way to uh, investigate autonomic dysfunction? And this goes in line with the question from Dr. Ali Ahmed from the audience. Thank you, Ali, for, the, for your question. So what's the world tilt table test in, in terms of vasodepressor effect or vasoexcitatory effect or even both? Right, so I think that we can join two questions in just yeah. one hour. So let, let, let's make it very practical and easy. So what, what anybody can do in the office is measure blood pressure supine and standing and concomitantly measure blood pressure and heart rate. By doing so, you are able to discriminate between secondary orthostatic hypotension and neurogenic hy orthostatic hypotension. If you have a patient with neurogenic orthostatic hypotension and you do not have a cause, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, amyloidosis, you will refer the patient to a neurologist or to a, to a center where you do autonomic testing. Now, the, the autonomic testing is very simple. It has been standardized. It's called the E-wing test, where you perform five tests in order to investigate the way your autonomic nervous system is working. You will do a tail test in order to look at the effect 
of uh, uh, standing up on blood pressure regulation and heart rate measurement. You will do a hand grip test. You will ask a patient to grip, uh, to do a hand grip for a couple of minutes and uh, you will look if blood pressure will increase, especially diastolic blood pressure. This will inform you about the small sympathetic fibers which are innervating the vessels. You will do a Valsalva test where you will ask a patient to breathe out in a small tube. 40 millimeters of mercury needs to be reached and you will look at how blood pressure goes down and up, that's called the overshoot, and see if there is an adapted regulation of your heart rate. Then you will do a stand-up test where you will ask the patient to stand the same way you did in your office. And finally, you will ask the patient to breathe at a fixed respiratory rate of 10 seconds and this six times per, per, per minute. So five seconds breathing in, five seconds breathing out and you repeat it for six times. And by doing so, you are able to measure vagal innervation to the heart and the vessel. So five tests giving you a score on five points. If it's abnormal one, normal zero. And if you have more than three, then you definitely have autonomic dysfunction. So these tests are usually done in referral centers where you are able to do autonomic testing. Okay, thank you very much, Atul. Uh, Alex, many uh, people from the audience are asking uh, whether uh, they can find the recording, so maybe you might highlight that. And I don't know if you want to uh, uh, ask more questions or if we're close to the end, so I'll leave it to you. Yeah, th thank you, Sergio. I think we can do just uh, one more round of one question for each uh, speaker. Uh, and afterwards, I will, I will uh, conclude with the details for the recording. So uh, we have uh, five more minutes. Uh, I would just uh, uh, would like to ask the speakers maybe to just to, uh, to answer quickly uh, to the audience, um, to the questions from the audience. So I have, I have a question for Peter. So how, uh, so can cholesterol be too low? Very interesting question because there is a sort of contradictory view on that. And there are people that say, and they're very reputable, that cholesterol should be zero, that we don't need LDL cholesterol, and that it's the best to have it as low as possible. Uh, and there are doctors and, and researchers like myself that feel that optimal cholesterol is roughly between 25 and 50. I think that is the sweet spot we should aim for, especially in secondary prevention, um, because we don't have any data for, for going to these very low levels. And I would be um, a little bit more careful before completely obliterating LDL cholesterol. So aiming for the sweet spot in very high risk between 25 and 50, I think would be optimal way to do it. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Sergio. Uh, okay, uh, Erin, I have a question from uh, Mihai Trofenchuk, which who's watching us, our good friend. Uh, he was asking, uh, within the heart team, which specialty do you consider essential in terms of those presented by you, the endocrinologist or obstetrics, gynecology? Oh, well, of course, it's a team-based uh, approach. So one of the things that we highlighted in the 2019 ACC AHA guidelines is a team-based approach to care. So not only does that include physicians, but includes our allied health professionals of dietitians, nutritionists, exercise physiologists, pharmacists, the whole team. So what a lot of um, referral centers are doing are actually um, having specialized multidisciplinary clinics. So we're doing this at Hopkins with our Women's Health Center, where we have um, experts interested in women's health, the holistic view of the woman. So we have OBGYN, we have cardiology, we have endocrine, we have GI, we have rheumatology, we have psychiatry, you know, cognitive testing. Um, not that all patients need to see all these specialists, but that we all work together as a group for coordinated care, because I think we're stronger when we all work together and in a coordinated fashion. So, of course, all those disciplines are important for women's health throughout her lifespan. Uh, Alex, can I Thanks. take the privilege of asking a tricky please. question to a tool? Yes, <laughs> go ahead, please. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about, you know, giving antihypertensive drugs in the evening? 
Does it really reduce outcomes? <laughs> I, see your, I see where you're going, but uh, unfortunately, I think that uh, this nice story brought up by the, by the Spanish authors is now uh, getting in, under investigation. And um, we know also from, uh, from the pharmacokinetics of these drugs taken chronically, that there are no reason that if you take drugs in the night, you might reduce uh, cardiovascular mortality as shown in this paper. So I would say, um, okay, for the management of supine hypertension, there is, a, there is I think, a, a scope of using chronopharmacology, so short-term acting drugs to cover supine hypertension during night, losartan, short-acting calcium channel blocker, uh, nitrate patch in order to, to control the risk but uh, I don't think that this is going to reduce uh, cardiovascular mortality or morbidity as shown in the ERADA paper. Thank you. I think this is a very important message because uh, many people discussed the, uh, the paper and now it's under investigation, it's under scrutiny. Uh, Alex. So yeah, thank you. Uh, just a quick question for Peter and for Erin. Um, so a tool uh, suggested a glass of wine and uh, some chocolate for the elderly. Uh, what do you say? Could we translate that uh, for also for ourselves? Uh, or for example, I'm, I'm 40 years old. Would that go for me? Chocolate yeah. and a glass of red wine. Yes. Red. Okay. If it's red wine, if it's French red wine, no problem. Yes, <laughs> French. I agree. Oh, but maybe Argentinian or Chile. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Napa Valley is also great for me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, we, we passed by, by, by almost 30 minutes uh, our, um, our uh, deadline. Uh, I would like to, to uh, thank uh, uh, all of uh, you. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, Sergio, for, uh, for your exceptional help. Thank you, Atul. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Erin. Um, I, uh, I am uh, deeply honored to have, uh, um, uh, to have had this webinar with you. Uh, I would just like to remind all the audience um, that uh, uh, tomorrow you receive uh, the link with the YouTube uh, um, uh, link uh, of the webinar. Uh, we had around uh, uh, 650 uh, subscribers and online overall on Zoom and Facebook uh, there were around 200 uh, online viewers. So thank you very much for, for, uh, for participating, dear speakers and uh, dear Sergio. Thank you very much to uh, the participants. And I hope to see you real soon. And uh, uh, I agree with Sergio. So real meetings, real live meetings, uh, um, miss, uh, I miss the real live meetings. And I hope we will uh, very soon, I hope, see each other and uh, have Either chocolate, either wine. <laughs> yes. So thank, thank you very you much. Have a nice evening. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.